Stone Arbor Church, we're so excited that you guys came in and joined us for worship this morning. Would you guys stand as we get started? I was buried beneath my shame. that truth that we were in darkness and you brought us into a glorious light and God your word says for you have brought us out of the darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son whom you love and it's only by his death and on the cross um, and him going into darkness himself and rising again that we can come out of our darkness God would you help every day daily for our walk to look more and more like Jesus's and help us today um, to learn more about your word, to honor you with our worship, and just be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Daily, daily I serve 
when I can't see morning by morning great is your faithfulness to me breath by breath over sinking by wonder one step at a time Good morning. Welcome to Stone Arbor Church. My name is Daniel, and I'm excited you decided to join us for today's service. Our mission here at Stone Arbor Church is inviting people to take their next steps with Jesus. And so we hope that you're able to do that today. We hope that you're able to come away today with the next step and move forward with Jesus. This morning, we're going to hear from Pastor Daniel Funderburk. I'm excited to hear from him. We're in a series called What's Your Story? So stay tuned for that. One quick note from me, you should have received a program on your way in. Go ahead and take that program out. In there, you're going to find something called our connection card. This is a great tool that allows for you to connect with us here at Stone Arbor. This is so important to us. We actually spend some time at the end of the service filling these out together. So hold on to those for now. Before I invite Pastor Daniel, I want to mention in two weeks, we have an exciting event happening. It's Easter. Two weeks till Easter. We go big for Easter. We uh, love to see what God does in people's lives around this season. Uh, we celebrate Jesus' birth, or, excuse me, his death and his resurrection. Uh, and this is an excellent time for you to invite and invest in people. Because Easter is a holiday a lot of people like to come to church for. This makes it an easy invitation. Uh, an invitation can change a life. In fact, last year we had three people come to Easter as guests and mark that they want to make Jesus the Lord of their life on their connection card, and later on they were baptized. So that's exciting, and we want to see that again this year. We want to see what God is doing and join with him as he works. Uh, now, take a moment. There's a card uh, that you should have seen on the top of your program that's an invest and invite card. Go ahead and take that out. Take a moment to write down three names of people you might invest and invite in to church for Easter. Uh, you can write those names down and be praying for them. Uh, and in, uh, we encourage you to join with us as we invite people to Easter. So again, thanks for being here. I'm going to invite up Pastor Daniel.
Good morning, everybody. My name is, my name is Daniel, if I haven't met you yet. Um, I serve as one of the pastors here at Stone Arbor Church, and so it's good to be with you all this morning. Would you pause and, and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, um, that you've given us space to worship you. And Lord, I can imagine as, as people are sitting in these seats and um, have had busy weeks, maybe stress and pressure in their lives, and lots and lots of distractions and things that may be weighing on them. Lord, I just pray that in these moments that you would help us to have um, just the ability to focus in on what it is you want for us today. Pray, Lord, that you would just give us um, clear next steps on how we can follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing on with part two of our message series, What's Your Story? So everybody loves a good story, right? Stories have the power to inspire us, to cause us to feel things very strongly. Um, And I don't know about you, but when I am immersed in a good story, whether it's something on Netflix, a a TV show, or it's uh, maybe a good book, I just, I want to stay in it. The world can sort of go away, and I can really enjoy and not want to put that book down. Has anybody else ever experienced sort of the power of a good story? And the more we take in a story, the more gripped we can be by what's going on and, and wrapped up in it. And um, when a character, you know, feels loss, we feel loss. Or when they experience joy or success, we, we can feel that same level of joy or success. And when they feel love, we can, we can feel love and so on. And so well-told stories can be really powerful. Now, I couldn't give this message today without at least giving you a clip from a story. We don't have time to watch a whole movie together. But I did want to show you guys a clip this morning, partly just to wake up, you know, to give you something. Um, And so I'm going to show you a clip from a movie from the 90s called Mission Impossible. I know there's been about 20 of them since then, but this is the original. And if you haven't seen it, it's a spy movie. It's It's centered around this character named Ethan Hunt. And he's got to go in and he's got to retrieve this specific disc that's important for the plot of the movie. Um, so he's got to go into this special secure vault. You may, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but in order for him to do that, he has to um, be very careful about some of the security measures that are in the vault. One is the temperature cannot change. Another is there can literally be no sound in the vault. Otherwise, it'll trigger the alarm. And then also, if, if he were to touch the ground, then it's going to trip the alarm as well. So, sets up the scene uh, for you guys. So, let's take a look and watch this short clip.
I don't know if your palms are getting a little bit sweaty just watching that scene, uh, but I just, I wanted to show that just because, you know, even, I, I just realized there's no words, but, it, and yet still it, it conveys like so much intensity. And so if you've, if you've seen that movie, you kind of know that's a pretty important part of the story. And actually those movies tend to get more and more ridiculous. So that scene was one of the least ridiculous of the Mission Impossible. Um, but good storytelling, it really just involves you in the process. You're just on the edge of your seat wanting to know what happens. So I'm not going to show you any more clips, but I did want to show a couple other movie snapshots. And if you've seen some of these movies, they do communicate some feelings, some emotions. <clears throat> so we have this one here. If you've seen uh, the Avengers, the Marvel series, this is sort of the climactic ending moment where there's been movies building up and there's been some... The bad guy it seems like he's going to win, and then all of a sudden, the movies are progressing and things are happening, and then this is like the final moment where Tony Stark, Iron Man, gets cosmic retribution and saves the day. So it's a pretty powerful scene. Or what about this one? It's from a movie called The Notebook. Now, I've seen this movie a long time ago. I could not tell you what's happening in this scene. I just, I googled uh, The Notebook famous scenes, and this one popped up a lot, so I know it's a romantic scene, but if you've seen the movie, it, it might communicate some feelings of, of relationship and romance. Or what about this one? This is from a movie called Taken. Um, it's Liam, Liam Neese has just found out that his daughter has been kidnapped, and he has a certain set of skills, and he is going to find his daughter and make sure uh, that the people that took her uh, pay for it. And so, again, it communicates a sense of, justice and getting the bad guys. And so I bring up these, these scenes and these, these uh, clips and pictures uh, just, to sh just to illustrate that stories are powerful. They're memorable, right? You remember a lot of these powerful scenes, and, and it can create a story that we all would love to experience more of. But something that's even more powerful than watching a good movie or something that's more important to us than reading a good book or hearing a good story is is, um, well, what's more important than, than a movie or a story? It's our story, right? Our story, a real story, our own personal story is more important than, than honestly, these, these movies. And so think for a second, what kind of story would you say that you're living? What would you say? What kind of story would you say that you're living right now? Perhaps you feel like your life is Maybe a romantic comedy, like The Notebook. Or maybe, maybe you feel like your life right action adventure, I would say, with some drama. And then sprinkled in moments of comedy. There's been some moments of comedy with our kids recently. and so. But it's really not that easy to put a label on our story, right? It's not that, it's not that easy. And so sometimes our story can feel a bit confusing at times. There's moments in our story, in our lives, that don't make a lot of sense. So maybe perhaps the the, the our lives can feel like a mystery. There's parts that we just can't quite understand. And it can lead to questions, and we don't always get those answers to those questions. And so in this series, what we hope to do is that you would walk away just to have a better appreciation of more than just your story, but the grand story, God's story. And sometimes by understanding God's story, it can actually bring a lot of sense for our own story. And so what is God's story? What is God's story? God's story is one of bringing about his restoration and transformation one person at a time. Restoration and transformation one life at a time because lives are precious to God. And it'd be impossible to tell this grand story without highlighting something that's very, very important for the Christian journey. And it's something we've talked about even in the announcements is uh, the idea of baptism. And that's something we're going to be celebrating next Sunday as a church is baptism. Now, why is baptism so important? Uh, in, a in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. Again, something we talked about in the announcements. Um, and Easter is really the time that Christians gather to remember and celebrate the fact that Jesus rose again from the, from the dead, from the, from the grave. He took the penalty of our sin. He put it on himself that we might experience newness of life. Now, when we get baptized, what we're saying is that it's actually very profound. Um, it's a symbolic experience of whenever you go into the water, you're saying, I'm no longer going to live for myself. I'm dying to my own way of living. And then when we come out of the water, it's the idea of 
God washing away our past and our sins and bringing about a new life for us. And we can experience that new life in Christ. Uh, baptism, again, isn't what saves us, but it's just it's, it's a symbolic thing of what, when we make that commitment to the Lord. So here's a picture of me, 1990s, getting baptized. James Avenue Baptist Church, Fort Worth, Texas. My father is baptizing me. And um, chili bowl haircut and all, getting baptized. And so this really was the beginning. It wasn't the point when I came to God and had it all figured out. But it was a starting point for me of committing my life to Christ, allowing him to take the penalty of my sins. And it started a journey of where I've been on. It's not been a perfect journey. I wouldn't say that my life has been perfect from this time. But what it has done is it has allowed God to work in my life day by day to help me to become more like him. As Bryce mentioned last week, baptism, it really marks the beginning point. It's an entry point with our walk with God. And um, even though we may experience lots of ups and downs in our journey with, with, with Christ, um, it's, it's beginning the transformation of what God is doing inside of us. <clears throat> now to shift gears just a little bit. Whenever uh, you're telling a great story, it can actually be really challenging. So I don't know if we have any people that have written stories or um, just appreciate a good story, but to tell a really timeless classic story, there's a lot that goes, there, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and so that people have different opinions on what are the ingredients that make up a really compelling story. But here are a few things I think we can agree on, uh, a few elements. And I'm going to use this just to launch us into our sermon today. So these are the four, four ideas or the four ingredients that, that make up a great story. So I'm going to run through these really quick, and we'll come back one by one. Um, but they're an engaging plot. Number one is they're an engaging plot. Number two is there's relatable characters. Number three is there's tension that needs to be resolved. And number four is there's a satisfying conclusion that brings change. And so if you'd like to follow along in your program, you have a listening guide in your program. And feel free to, to read along as, as we go further in. Now, we've been looking at the book of Acts and a few select stories of individuals who've chosen to make that next step of baptism. Again, it's a critical part of the story that God is telling. And so there's one verse that kind of summarizes what God is doing in the book of Acts, and it's found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, you will receive power. He's talking to the disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that continued on in the Christian church from that point 2,000 years ago until today. And so let's dive in a little bit more to the idea of, of a plot. So the first point is that um, to have an engaging story or to, have a, have, to tell a great story, you need an engaging plot. So what is a plot? A plot, basically, in simple definition, is it describes what's happening in a story. That's it. Describes the events of the story. So, but maybe to put a little bit of a different spin on it, it's people doing interesting things, right? You read a book, you watch a movie because you want to see some interesting things happen. You want to see the development. The better the plot, the more in the interesting of the things that are happening, right? Um, and that's what's happening in the book of Acts. The disciples took what Jesus commissioned them to do, and they go do interesting stuff. They're not, they're not breaking into vaults. They're not doing that kind of thing. But they're going out and they're sharing their beliefs with people. And as a result, it leads to some really engaging stories of God working through the disciples. So Jesus had given this commission to his followers. He had healed people when he was here on earth. He had taught them what it means to live in the kingdom and, and why he came and why he died. And then when he ascends into heaven, he sends the disciples out in the countryside to share this news with others. So they start in Jerusalem, and then there's persecution that breaks out. So many of the disciples are spread throughout the towns. And as they're going, they're ob obediently sharing and just they're just witnessing, they're doing the things that, that Jesus commissioned them to do um, and it sets up this whole, whole book of Acts found in the New Testament. And so what we're going to look at today is one particular story from the book of Acts, chapter 8, um, and starting verse 26. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read the story, and um, then we'll talk about some of the points afterwards. So starting in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and he went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. 
he had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The Spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and fell for somebody else. Someone else. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling on the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down. Seeing revival take place and lots of people responding to the gospel. And then out of nowhere, he gets a direct order from God to go to this lonely road toward Gaza. So it's an interesting plot. It's kind of like, why, why is this happening? So here's a map, just to give you an idea. He had started up here in the area of Samaria, and God had commissioned him to go down past Jerusalem onto this road. Now, if you read the story, you may be thinking, oh, okay, well, it was maybe like an hour's journey. But it probably took him a few days to maybe a week to get to that lonely road. And if I was Philip, I, I would be asking myself, what is going on? Why, why are you taking him away, me away from this fruitful ministry in order to go out into the middle of nowhere where I could get beaten up or mugged. It's crazy. And yet God had a purpose for this, which we'll see as we, as we talk about it. He was working in ways that may not have made sense to Philip at the time. And yet, if Philip could see the larger, grander story of what God was doing, then this would not seem like a strange request. And so Philip, he chose to obey. All he did was he started walking. He did simple, small thing, walking. And honestly, most of our opportunities today if you're a believer, is to obey are actually small daily steps to choose to do what's right. Now, I've had many times where God has prompted me to do certain things. Some are big, some are small. A lot of them are just simple ways, whether it's reaching out to my coworker or it's sharing Christ uh, or even just identifying that I'm a part of a church and inviting people to join in. Um, and often, honestly, most of those times, there's a, a sense of anxiety or concern or worry that, I don't know, how is this person going to think about me when I, when I do this? And every single time it requires some courage to just do what God asked me to do, even in small things. And yet when we respond and obey what God is asking us to do, we get to play a part in God's grand story as it unfolds. And so if you want to participate in what God is doing, just choose consistent obedience. Just choose to do some simple things over time we see that with Philip. He's choosing to do the things that God asked him to do. And as we choose consistent obedience, we get to play that part, a part, as God's story unfolds. And not only does it advance the story of what God is doing, but as we participate in what he's doing, a lot of times, at least for me, it sort of can clear up some fogginess of what's going on in terms of my purpose or my meaning in life as I as I am willing to extend an uh, invitation to somebody or help them learn more about God or just walking the walk, a lot of times that helps clarify my own purpose in, in my life and my, my own story starts to make more sense. And that's just something to ponder is that consistent obedience often brings clarity to our lives over time. It doesn't mean you, you do what God asks you to do and then everything becomes clear, but as we consistently obey what he asks us to do, it can bring a lot of clarity for us over time. And so if you're kind of trying to wrestle through where you're at and all that, um, this quote in particular has been helpful for me. It's from a guy, a pastor named Henry Blackaby, who wrote a book called Experiencing God. And he says, watch to see where God is working and join him in his work. So if you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do, join with God in his work. Join Starna Arbor in, in the work God's doing here. Uh, participate in a what, on what's happening here. And as you do that, it will begin to bring clarity over time on your story and your purpose. Um, so that's the first thing, is just good stories have engaging plots. The second one, the second element of a great story is great stories have relatable characters. They have relatable characters. They have people that you could see yourself being like in the stories. And so in the series, we're covering sort of three threads. We talked about the first one, which is God's story. Um, 
But then there's also a couple other things. There's the people that God uses, the stories of what of people God uses, and then there's the people who respond. So you see Philip is being used by God, and then, and then the eunuch is responding to, to an invitation to follow God. And so here's just a simple chart. It kind of shows the difference between Philip and the eunuch, just so you can see. Philip was an insider. He, he was an insider in a, what God was doing, and he was charged as a witness for that gospel message. He had experienced God work in his life, and he was choosing to obey and walk by faith. And the Lord had given him the answers to questions that people were asking. He's leading them toward those people. So that's Philip. Maybe you can relate to Philip. Maybe you feel like you've been, you are an insider, or you uh, have been changed by, by what God has done. And you do have answers to share. Or maybe, maybe you're on more on the right side, the eunuch. He was an outsider. He was, um, he was actually being stirred up by God um, and being prompted by God to go and, and to this wilderness area where Philip met him. Um, maybe you're wrestling with just some confusion, whether it's your story or about God. Maybe you're seeking answers. Maybe you're uncertain about the essentials of the Christian faith. Um, and so I don't know which side of the aisle you would say that you relate more to, um, but as you read the Bible, you'll just see, if you really actually focus in on some of the characters, a lot of the things that they wrestle with are very relatable things that many of us deal with today. And we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into the eunuch in just a minute. But I'm going to move on to the third element of a great story, which is that a great storyteller builds tension that needs to be resolved. As time goes on, there's conflict and there's tension and it drives the plot of the story. Where the tension lies is often where the most important part of the story is. And so it's often where the character has to make a major choice, and it's also where they tend to grow and develop the most, and, and that, can be, that can be relatable as well. So I don't know about you, but for me, some of those biggest moments in life transformation, they happen when there's some internal tension going on inside of me. Can anybody relate? Some of those important moments, there, there's some internal tension that's happening. And for me, the, a constant question that comes up related to this is, am I going to take this, this Jesus thing seriously? Am I actually going to take it seriously? Am I going to do what he says to do? Or am I going to sort of dial back, dial back in and coast and sort of chicken out? And I'm not saying that I've always made the right decisions. Sometimes I have. Sometimes I've given in to fear and not done the right thing. Um, but what we see here is that a lot of times the most important decisions, they're happening here in those, in those internal tensions that are happening inside of us. And we can see some evidence of that with the eunuch. We can't see all of it. It doesn't explain what's going on inside of him. But we do see that he is, he's reading through the prophecy, which is the book of Isaiah. It's found in cha- chapter 53. And it's this, it's this prophecy about a suffering servant. And we know that is the suffering of Jesus. But he wouldn't have known that at the time as he was reading it. Um, but as he's reading this scroll or this prophecy, it would have been very hard to reconcile these thoughts. Uh, the verse says, he was pierced for, because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and by his, by, and we are he. Suffering has to do with our redemption. Why is someone getting crushed or punished for me, he might have been thinking, why, is God, why does God allow this to happen to him? And why does God allow suffering in general? You might have those thoughts. Why is God allowing me to experience suffering in my story or hardship my story? Why is my story the way that it is? And so we know for this eunuch, he went up to Jerusalem to a place to worship God. He was trying to understand God. He was trying to relate to God. Um, and on the way, he might have experienced it says he was an Ethiopian. That just really means he was from the continent of Africa. So he probably looked different than the people in Jerusalem. He might have experienced some prejudice. He might have experienced just feeling like an outsider. And so, but he went up to the place of worship, but he was still not able to find God in Jerusalem. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you've come to this place of worship and you still have a lot of questions about God. You have a lot of questions about your own story. And why things maybe are the way that they are. And this can create mounting tension, right? If you have unanswered questions, it can create a lot of tension. And it can also lead to some wrong conclusions. Maybe there is no God. Maybe God is not concerned about your story after all. And if this is you, we'd love to talk with you further and help you 
process through some of those questions related to God and also allow you space to be here and just to investigate at your own pace. And so we don't know all the answers to why God allows suffering, but what we do know is that it cannot be because he doesn't care. God does not allow suffering because he doesn't care. He does care. And this is part of what Philip was explaining to him in this passage. He's explaining Jesus. He was explaining that Jesus came and he took on the suffering that mankind was experiencing because he wanted us to have that relationship with God. And so for the eunuch, it was important enough for God to personalize this message, to take Philip out of this prosperous ministry all the way, maybe a hundred miles, all the way out to the middle of nowhere to explain to this one person what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. But God cared about this eunuch enough to do that. And I think God is really, he's in the details. He does care. He's actually involved in the story of our lives. He longs for us as we're wrestling through that internal tension, as we're just trying to understand our own story, as we're processing some pains or some hurt that we have, and he wants us to lean toward him. So I found that in moments of internal tension, the best thing to do is to lean toward God and not away from him, to lean toward God and not away from him. And as you reflect on your own story, what are some of the tensions that you're facing in your own story? Are you questioning God's goodness? Are you wondering maybe how long you may have to endure some particular hardship or difficulty? Maybe there's a relationship where you, you feel like every time you think about it, it makes you sad in your heart. Maybe you just feel stuck. Maybe you just feel like you cannot progress in your story. And it's a time to just wrestle through some of those internal tensions and see what God may be speaking to you in those moments. And God actually does meet us in those moments in our story, and he wants us to lean into him and ask him for help. And so lastly, all great stories, they have tension, but they have a satisfying conclusion. They end with a satisfying conclusion that brings change. And so, you know, a good book or a good movie will, it'll have all these different things, and they all sort of come together at the end. You're like, oh, okay. I now see how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together. And as a result, the characters are changed, and they're never the same. A good story creates high levels of tension, and then it relieves that tension as the story concludes, and then the characters are different as a result. And so the eunuch had been led by God. He's dealing with this tension. He meets this random hitchhiker, Philip, who explains to him what it means to walk with Jesus, what it means to uh, have newness of life. And he does a couple things as a result that I want to focus on. First is that he responds. He, he hears the good news and he responds to Jesus. He took action. Often we have conditioned ourselves to maybe hear a good sermon or to God may give us some truth. And if we're not careful, we go, mm, yeah, that was good. That was helpful. And then, and then nothing happens. But that's not what the eunuch does. He responds. He takes action. A lot of times the excitement and participating with God in his story comes as we respond and we obey what he's telling us to do. And I think it's fair to to say that if you want to see progress happen in your walk with the Lord, if you will just develop a healthy rhythm of responding to what he says to do, even if it's simple things, develop a a rhythm of receiving some, some insight from the Lord or from a godly person, and then just putting it into practice, you develop a healthy rhythm of doing that, You'll see, um, you'll see growth. You'll see growth take place, and maybe very quickly. And so for you, I don't know what that next step could be, but um, if it's baptism, if you've not been baptized, if, you're, if, if the Lord is stirring something inside of you to consider baptism, I recommend taking that step forward, or at least talking to a pastor or talking to someone that you trust to see if that makes sense for where you're currently at. And so he responded, and that's what he did. He responded with baptism. And that leads to the second thing, as a result of him responding to what the Lord was doing, it brought about a happy conclusion. He went away rejoicing. Isn't that wonderful? I don't have the verse up here, but um, the message translation says, he went back down the road and was happy as he could be. He went back down the road and was happy as he could be. I just get the image of him walking down the road, does like a jump in the air, clicks his heels, and he's just whistling a merry tune. Um, that's sort of the image that we have, is that he was, he was rejoicing in, what, in the breakthrough that he had. 
Philip had explained that God had come near to him, and it unlocked something in his mind, and it brought clarity where maybe there was fogginess before, and he decided to get baptized. He said, there's a river. Let's just do this thing. Let's, let's get baptized. And so that's what we're focusing on here in this series in baptism, because it is such an important, crucial part of the Christian journey. And so at Stone Arbor, we have a process to work through, um, but I would just consider you, consider that you take Take the step of asking about it, maybe on your connection card, just marking, I'd like more information about, ba- about baptism that's happening next Sunday. Baptism, again, is not, you're not coming to God saying, I'm perfect, I've got it all figured out. It's rather just an entry point saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I need your help, and I'm willing to take that step forward with you. It's a declaration saying, God, I'm willing to make that my faith public, and I'm willing to identify as a follower of you. So when I think about my own spiritual journey, and I think about some of those tense moments and those forks in the road, a lot of times I, I just, I have some nagging questions that have to be resolved. One is, do I really matter? Do I actually matter? Does my story really matter in God's, in God's story? And the second thing is, can God really use me? Can I participate in with what God is doing? And so as I was preparing this message, I just, I had a thought. I thought, you know, I wonder, I wonder if the book of Isaiah, where he's where he's reading about the prophecies, I wonder if it, if it brings up the idea of the eunuch. You know, I just wonder if it does. And so I just Googled, or I just put in Bible Gateway the word eunuch, and in Isaiah, a couple of examples of the word eunuch pop up. And so he was reading in Isaiah 53, just three chapters later, Isaiah 56, so he probably got to this part in the scroll, it, came, it comes to this, these verses that I thought were pretty encouraging. Isaiah 56, starting verse 3, says, No foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord should say, The Lord will exclude me from his people. And the eunuch should not say, Look, I am a dried up tree. For the Lord says this, For the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. So God gave this promise to the eunuch. Now, if you don't know what a eunuch is, they, they are not able to have children. They are biologically, either through birth or through procedure, they cannot, they cannot have kids. So imagine just the psychological or the emotional toll that that would have on a person, just not, not knowing that they, they are inable, unable to do that. And yet God is speaking directly to this type of person, to this eunuch who's wrestling with identity and wrestling with his story and his purpose. And so as a result, Philip's gospel message transforms his perspective and it transforms his life. So um, he might be thinking, you know, I, I don't know if God can use him. I don't know if my life matters. You know, I don't, I know I can't have biological children. Like what, what can I pass on to others? Um, and can God, can God use my life? And so history tells us, or tradition tells us, that this man who was just this random guy in a chariot that God, that God saved, tradition tells us that he actually went back to his homeland. He went back to Ethiopia, the Africa, and he was, they, they say he was the first convert that went to the continent of Africa and was able to share his faith with people. He was a person of influence. And so God used him to spread the gospel to, to play a pretty significant role in God's story to bring the gospel message to to parts of Africa and to really play a key role in just sharing the good news. And so when that news of Jesus just sunk deeply into his heart, he was changed and he he was, the natural outcome was joy. I want to share this with others. Maybe I can't have kids of my own, but I can have spiritual kids. I can mentor and I can disciple others and I can explain to them the way that God transformed me. He wasn't a dried up tree. He was very fruitful in God's eyes. God spoke directly into the very thing that may have caused him to feel rejected and unwanted and useless. So let me ask you, what's your story? Are you wrestling with maybe some internal tensions? Maybe it's God's goodness. How can God redeem my story? Take courage in knowing that God is in the business of bringing healing and restoration. He says to you, you're not a dried up tree. You have potential and God can use you as you take steps with him. So maybe you identify more with the eunuch, or maybe you identify more with with Philip. You've been entrusted with so much, 
And will you be his witness this week? Would you consider taking a step, taking that invite card, and including and inviting somebody to participate in what God is doing here at Stone Arbor in order that people might get a more clear picture of what God is up to? As a worship team comes back onto the stage, would you consider taking a next step? Maybe your next step is baptism. Maybe, maybe it's marking on that connection card. I'd like more information. Or I'd like to participate in baptism. And I pray that that would be something that you'd consider. Um, just talk, maybe maybe in the, in the next step with that is just, is just talking to somebody and just processing your own spiritual journey to see if that makes sense for you. Another step you could take is to ask yourself, where could I take a courageous step of obedience? If you have been baptized, maybe, maybe God has been prompting you and stirring in you to take a step of obedience with him that you've been reluctant to take. And it takes courage, and you can ask God for help. And then lastly, write down where you may be getting stuck and who you could talk to about it. All of us get stuck at different times. We, don't, we can't make progress in what maybe the journey that God has for us. And for me, whenever I feel like I'm stuck, it brings a sense of stagnation, discouragement, maybe a feeling of hopelessness. But consider writing down where you may feel stuck and then who you could process that with that with this week. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that cuts into our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the grander story that you're telling that goes beyond just um, the simple things of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you allow us to participate in on what you're doing. And even though sometimes our actions may feel really small, God, you can use even small things that we do, simply obeying and choosing to do those things with courage. We pray, Lord, that this week you'd empower us uh, to do even those simple things and choose courage and to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you guys stand? And on that 
glad you were here to worship with us this morning. Now let's jump back into the connection card we mentioned at the beginning of the service. This connection card is a starting point to connection and growth with us. Here you can identify the next step that you're taking by checking one of the boxes on the card. We're eager to support you as you take your next steps with Jesus. Also, the connection card is a great place to leave your prayer requests. We'd really love to know how we can pray for you this week. As you complete this card with as much information as you feel comfortable with, we can keep you in the loop on what's happening at our church. You've got a few options for filling out the card. You can go digital with our Church Center app, scan the QR code found on the back of your program, or you can just use the connection card included in your program and drop it in the offering baskets when they come around. Let's take a quick moment to pause and fill those out now. Now we'll take a moment to receive our tithes and offerings. Stone Arbor is fully supported by the generous giving of our church family. You'll notice the ushers coming forward with offering baskets now. If you came prepared to give today, you can use the giving envelope in your program or any of these additional ways that you see on the screen. This moment of our service is an opportunity for us to worship Jesus, who is the ultimate picture of generosity. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Through his sacrifice and generosity, we were given the opportunity for eternal life. And as we give back to God, we invite you to worship him and thank him for what he's done. Your generosity fuels the mission of our church. Thank you for being part of the work God is doing here through your giving. If this is your first time joining us at Stone Arbor, we're so glad that you're here. Swing by our guest table in the breezeway to grab a free Stone Arbor coffee mug. This is just a small way for us to say thanks for being here today. Bring your connection card and meet our friendly team of staff and volunteers. We would love to connect with you and share this gift with you. As the offering is gathered, let's look ahead to some exciting events. Next Sunday, we have a baptism celebration. At Stone Arbor, we love coming alongside and celebrating those who are ready to publicly declare through baptism that they've decided to follow Jesus. The baptism will be held in between services and we'll have cupcakes to celebrate. As you heard earlier in our service, Easter is two weeks away. Every year, Easter provides us with a huge opportunity that our church rallies around to invite our city and the people in our lives to come to Stone Arbor. Jesus' resurrection was God's rescue plan. That's why Easter is so significant. And this is why we want to invite as many people as possible to join us at Stone Arbor for Easter. So on Easter Sunday, March 31st, we'll hold two services, 9 o'clock and 1030 at our Orange Crest campus. We're preparing and praying for many, many guests to join us as we share about the hope we have because of the resurrection. It'll be a celebratory day with fun and giveaways for the kids, a photo booth, and more. Here are two ways that we are preparing for Easter that we'd like to invite you to. First, help us spread the word about Easter by joining us for Invite Riverside. At Invite Riverside, we're rallying the whole Stone Arbor family for a multifaceted project to serve and invite our city to experience the hope of the Easter story. 
Our goal is to share 5,000 invitations to Easter at Stone Arbor and bless people in Riverside in a few practical ways. You can be part of helping us hit this goal and inviting our city to join us for Easter. We'll rally at two different sites, our Orange Crest campus and our Glenhaven campus, pray for our city and then break into different teams. Because we believe the story of Easter changes lives for eternity, we are inviting as many people as possible. There will be options for people of all physical abilities and ages to serve. Register on Church Center so we know that you're coming. Another way we're preparing for Easter is by holding a Good Friday Lord's Supper service. This communion service is set aside to allow us to reflect on the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and what this means for our lives. We will prepare our hearts for Easter and pray for the opportunities we have as a church. The time will include worship, reflection, and communion as we show our gratitude for Jesus' sacrifice and obedience to God. To find out more about all of these events I mentioned and more, we invite you to head over to stonearbor.com events or our church center app to learn more and register. Thanks, Stone Arbor. Wow. Well, I can say there's a lot of exciting things coming up in the next couple weeks. And uh, would you guys stand as we, as we close our service here? darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.